Hello everyone and welcome to section 2.1 which will be about functions. Uh, specifically this, this section is pretty intense and there's a lot to talk about so we're going to break this up into two parts. Um, but of course just like the normal videos, there will, uh, at the end of this video, this part one video, there will be some extra practice problems that are um, like either more practice or also like kind of more challenging problems and then the same thing will be true for the next video as well. Now let's get go ahead and get into it. And just as a as a note about this section, this is probably my favorite section in all of mathematics. Um, and you guys want to know why? It's got fun in the name. How could it not be awesome, right? And I'll wait for you guys to to get back in your chairs after you've like just completely gone into hysterics about that. But all all jokes aside, functions are basically the building blocks of all of mathematics later on. Like they are so important to a lot of things and they are very, very good at helping us visualize concepts in in future math courses in addition to this one. So I think they're one of the most useful things and like they're one of the things we should study the most in mathematics. So before we even talk about functions though, we need to talk about relations. So relations... So then this little sub uh, subsection is relations versus functions. And we'll start off with the definition. The definition is a relation is a set of ordered pairs x comma y. It's just a set, uh, it's a collection of x comma y's. Now, we can make that incredibly complex or we can make it very simplistic based on the rules that we impart on our, uh, on our ordered pairs. So for example, it, uh, we could just have a set of just a bunch of points or we could have like a specific requirement on x's and y's. So like a circle, x squared plus y squared equals four, that is a relation. It's relating x and y in the sense that when x is squared and y is squared, they need to equal 4. So, as an example, uh, like a pretty, or, oh, before that, actually, um, one thing is a sub-definition, sub if you will, is the set of all x values is called the domain of the relation. Uh, like, if we want to be particular, it would be the domain of the relation, but either way. The set of all y values is called the range. Oop, wrong color. The range. We'll deal more with range uh, in the next section, in section 2.1, so next week. But for now, this will be totally fine. We're, we're mostly going to talk about domain. But let's look at an example of this to, to bring things home. Let's say you have the set R equals, in, uh, in quiggly, uh, squiggly braces, uh, we're going to have four points. We're going to have the point negative 1, comma 2, the point 3, comma negative 4, the point 0, comma 2, and the point 7, comma 10. This is a relation. It's a collection, it's a set of four ordered pairs, where x equals negative 1, is associated with the y value 2, x equals 3 is associated with the y value negative 4, and so on and so forth. Here, the domain is going to be a collection of just values. So looking at the x values here, we got negative 1, 3, 0, and 7. So we'll write those down, negative 1, 3, 0, and 7. And if we wanted to be very particular, yes, we could probably arrange this in ascending order from most negative to most positive, but it's not going to be necessary. If, our, if, if the problem asks for it, then we'll do it, but I'm going to just continue onward. And the range is the set of all y values. So 2, negative 4, 2, uh, 10. 2 is repeated twice. 2 is repeated. So we don't need to write it both times. We just need to write it once. So our range is going to be 2, negative 4, and 10. Of course, we could, once again, write this in ascending order from most negative to most positive. We've wanted to, but we don't need to. Now, I don't want to get too bogged down with relations because they're not going to be, they're going to be more useful for later on math courses. We're going to be more interested in functions. So, what is a function? Definition. A function is a relation. It's a special type of relation. So, a function is a relation in which... 
each x value of the domain gets quote unquote mapped slash sent to exactly one. So one and only one y value. So that, that's an added requirement. It means that each x value gets only like can only be sent to one y value. So for example, I don't know why I went to the back page. Let's look at an example. I'm going to give you two relations. The first relation is going to be the points uh, 2 comma negative 1, 3 comma 4, and the point 2 comma 5. Now this is, is not a function. Now why is it not a function? Well look at the x value 2. Notice that it appears in two separate points. The x value 2 gets sent to the y value negative 1 and to the y value 5. It gets sent to two different things. So this is not a function. So the reason is x equals 2 got sent to two y values. Think of a function as kind of a machine. It takes in one input and it needs to spit out one output. It can't say x goes to two different things because that would make it so that it's not like giving an input and one output. So that's the example of not a function. If I gave you a relation r to be, let's say, 1 comma 1 comma negative 2 comma negative 3 and then 3 comma 1, this is a function. Because each, uh, the reason is that each x value uh, got mapped to exactly one y value. Yes, yes, one, uh, like x equals one and x equals three both got sent to the y value one. That's fine. It's, it's okay for multiple x values to go to the same y value. It's just one x value can't go to multiple different things like it did here. Two went to negative one and to five. So that's gonna be the issue. Now these are a very, very uh, niche example of the types of uh, determining whether something's a function or not that we're gonna see. We're gonna learn in, uh, uh, in section 2.2 a very, very quick way of determining whether or not things are functions, but what if you can't graph it? Like, and that's, but that's gonna require a graph. The question is, what if you don't have a graph or you can't graph it? So, how to determine it? So determining functions algebraically. And the key thing to know here, the key thing is that if we can solve for y, that is, if you can get it as y equals stuff with x's, then it's a function. If not, not a function. Now there's a little more nuance to it, and that, like, but for everything that we're going to be concerned with in this course, that will be a good enough description of what, like, of how to find, to, 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 how to determine whether or not something's a function algebraically. So let's look at some examples. So these examples would say determine if the following are functions. So part A will be um, x plus 3x squared plus y minus 5 equals 0. And part B will be x squared plus y squared equals 10. So solution. Part A. I'm going to rewrite it. Three, uh, x, oh, x plus 3x squared plus y minus 5 equals 0. Now the question is, can we solve this for y? And the answer is yes. We can subtract 3x squared from both sides, subtract an x, add a 5, and we can do that, and we'll get y equals negative 3x squared minus x plus 5. 
And that is definitively y equals stuff with x's. So yes, this is a function. Yes, it is. Whereas if, like, I'm, I'm giving it away, the answer, but x squared plus y squared equals 10. Now, at first glance, you may already know, like we know this represents a circle and then you may know about the vertical line test and all that jazz, but let's say you didn't and say, well, let's see if we can try and solve this for y. Well, we'd, we'd subtract x squared from both sides. We'd get y squared is equal to 10 minus x squared or negative x squared plus 10, it doesn't matter. But that's not y equals, that's y squared equals. So our natural idea would be to take the square root of both sides and that would cancel the square. But remember that taking the square root of both sides, we have to add on that plus or minus. So then we get y equals plus or minus the square root of 10 minus x squared. And this causes an issue. And the reason why is imagine if I plug in an x value, let's just say I plug in one for the sake of an argument, then I'll get the square root of nine, which would be three, but I'll get y equals plus or minus three. So the x value one would give me three and negative three for my y values. It would give me two y values. So this is not a function. Because if you plug in one x value, you'll get two different y values. And the definition of a function, if we remember right over here, it says that each x value in the domain gets sent to one specific y value. So it couldn't get sent to both three and negative three. That's a problem. And with that, we'll move on to function notation. And so here, to set the stage, consider the, the line y equals 2x minus 1 is a function, right? Based on the, the, the trick that we learned in the previous section, if you can get it to be y equals a number, or y equals stuff with x's, then it is a function. We'll find more ways to figure out later. But instead, uh, like most of the time, we'll use the following notation. That is, we'll write f and then we'll put parentheses around an x and then say equals 2x minus 1. Now, this, the way this is spoken is this is f of x equals 2x minus 1. So this parentheses around x, this is not f times x. This is, red, this is spoken f of x. And what it means is we're going to input an x value into this function. So here, let's talk about some jargon. Here, the first bullet point is f is the name of the function. f is the name of the function. So you'll see later on we'll have multiple functions in, in different parts. So we usually use the, the letter uh, right here to define what the name of the function is. The other thing is that x is the input, sometimes called, so aka the independent variable, because you're just gonna plug in random x values. And then f of x, not f, but f of x is the function value. Spoken differently, i.e., that is, the y value corresponding to a given x value. So this is one of the things that a lot of students have difficulty understanding at first, is that this notation, y equals 2x minus 1, and f of x equals 2x minus 1, they mean the same thing. It's just that this notation here gives us a better idea of what's going on. We're taking an x value, and we're gonna plug it in for x, you don't need to draw that, um, and it's going to result in a value over here, and that's gonna be the function value. So x is what you put into the function, f of x is what you get out. So let's go ahead and see that in, in action. So example, and I'm gonna put f of x equals 2x minus one, just for reference over here, you don't need to write that, but it's just, this is the function that we're gonna be using. So f of three means to substitute 
uh, 3 in for x. That's pretty bad handwriting. Let me write that again. Substitute 3 in for x. So the way I like to write it when we're first seeing it, so f of 3, that's f of 3. That's the function value when you plug in x equals 3 equals 2, and then we're going to replace every instance of x. In this case, there's just that first one. If this had been like x squared minus 1x, then we'd have to plug it in twice in two different places. But we only need to plug it in here once. So f of 3 equals 2 times 3 minus 1, which is 5. So x equals 3 is the input, and 5 is the function value. The function or y value. Now I'm hitting on an important thing, and I'm like many books don't mention this. Sullivan, our, our textbook, does this a, a very, very briefly. So I'm going to write this as honestly uh, a theorem. It's not really mentioned in the book. But what the theorem says is that the point a comma b is on the graph. of f, the function f, if and only if f of a is equal to b. That's a very power state, powerful statement. We'll talk more about that in a little bit, but suffice it to say right now, what I'm saying is that the point on the graph that has an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, what it's telling us is that when you evaluate the function at your x-coordinate, you get your y-coordinate. And vice versa when we talk about graphical interpretations, which will come in a little bit. But we'll more on that later. So we need to get practice with this, like, evaluating functions. And the thing is, not only can you evaluate functions at values, like specific numbers, you can also evaluate it at random things. And that, that becomes much more useful later on when we talk about, like, calculus and things like that. But let's go ahead and get some practice with evaluating functions at both value, actual values, and then random expressions as well. So example, if g of x is equal to x squared minus 4 over 2x minus 3, find, and simplify as well, find a is going to be g of 2, b is going to be g of negative x, c is uh, g of uh, g of 5a, and d is going to be g of x plus h. And that'll, like, th this one right here, by the way, this one will become more useful uh, in the next video, in the part 2 video. So, solution. Part a, g of 2. What that means is you're going to substitute in 2 for x, wherever you see it. So we have two instances of x. We have an x squared and we have a 2x. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace those with 2's, and we get 2 squared minus 4 over 2 times 2 minus 3. That'll be 0 over 1, which will just be 0. So as a small note, as we'll, we'll talk more about this uh, next week when we talk about function about like graphs of functions and stuff. But this means, based on our previous theorem right here, that since g of 2 is equal to 0, that means that 2 comma 0 is on the graph, but that's, that's for later. So that's the, the function g evaluated at 2. Next we'll talk about, uh, like we'll do g of negative x. So this is why I always recommend putting your, the thing that you're plugging in, even if it's a positive number or whatever, put it in parentheses because, like, and I'm going to show you what not to do after I write the correct version. So this is going to be negative x quantity squared minus 4 over 2 times negative x minus 3. Now don't write this down, but this is a very easy mistake that students make. They just write this. And that is not the same. These are not the same thing. This is read as negative the quantity x squared, whereas this is read as the quantity negative x squared. So you might know what you're doing, of course, and I know we're trying to do these things very fast because we're trying to get through our homework and our exams as quickly as possible, but when you're doing things quickly, you might forget that this negative is attached to the x 
It's on the inside of the parentheses. It needs to get squared as well. So just don't make that mistake, please. I will destroy you if you do that. I will come through this computer and, and smack you. So we want to simplify this anyways. So that's why I put everything that I evaluate in parentheses. Now, if you feel comfortable skipping steps, you're more than welcome to. But this becomes x squared because negative x quantity squared is just x squared minus 4 over negative 2x minus 3. And that's as far as we can get that one. Oh, I should have boxed my first answer. Part C, g of 5a, just means going to input 5a for every place that we see an x. It doesn't matter that it's not a real variable. Like, it's, it's a different variable. It's not a number. It doesn't matter. You can evaluate functions wherever you want. Heck, you could even put a box in if you wanted. We could have calculated g of box. But we're not going to do that right now. Uh, so this will be, in parentheses, 5a squared minus 4 over 2 times in parentheses 5a minus 3. Remember, that 5 also needs to be squared, so don't forget about putting the parentheses around that. Simplifying that, that'll be 25a squared minus 4 all over 10a minus 3. Last but not least is g of x plus h. And this is, again, why I recommend putting in parentheses. So x plus h squared minus 4 over 2 times the quantity x plus h minus 3. Now, don't write this down, by the way. Like, I'm just wanting you to observe. So do not write this down. Just listen. If you just did this, you might think that this is just x by itself and then h squared. And then you might think that this is 2x plus h, but it's not. It's not. We have to apply the 2 to the x and the h. We have to apply the square to the x and the h. So that's a big difference. And so as a reminder, you've got to FOIL this, right? And you don't have to write this down. I'm just reminding us that this is x plus h times x plus h. And you've got to FOIL. So you'll get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 4 all over 2x plus 2h minus 3. And there's nothing else that, like, there's no other simplification that needs to happen because there's no like terms in the numerator, no like terms in the denominator, and there's nothing else to simplify. So that is our answer for part D. And we'll move on to the last subsection of uh, this lecture, which is on domains of functions. Now, before I even write down what I want to say, just as a note, we're going to be using interval notation on this, so if you need a refresher on that, go ahead and look at some of the videos that I've posted on, uh, on interval notation. But otherwise, I'm going to assume that you know uh, interval notation, and we're going to go on from that. So in, when it comes to a graph of a function, finding domain and range is, is pretty, uh, pretty nice. But when it comes to trying to find those things algebraically, first off, finding, alge like finding ranges algebraically is something we're not really going to cover in this course too much because um, it's actually quite tedious. But finding domains is something we can do. So let's talk about how we do it. So the domain of a function is all the x values that can be plugged in be quote unquote plugged in to the function. So what I mean by plugging in is inputting random x values. So remember the 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 all the x values are the things in the domain and all the y values are the things in the range. So as long as you can plug it into the function, it'll be part of the domain. So basically As long as we're not dividing by zero, uh, or taking a square, uh, or taking an even root of a negative number. So like the square root of negative five, right? Right. That that's not a real number. That's that's a complex number. So as long as we're oh, sorry about that. I dropped something. Um, as long as we're not dividing by zero or taking an even root, like the fourth root, the square root, and so on and so forth of a negative number, we're good. 
And what do I mean by that? Well, let's talk about the procedure. Procedure. And it's pretty quick, and it's quote unquote procedure because it's not like definitively the only way to solve to find domains. But what you're going to do is you're going to start by assuming. That's bad. That the domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. So you're just going to assume that it's all real numbers. Then you're going to remove quote unquote problem values. So let's go ahead and look at some examples to, to drive this point home. Example. Um, for f of x equaling 2x minus 1 like we've had, there are no problem values. There are no problem values. We can plug in whatever value of x we want, and we'll always get a real number. We always will get something that is defined. So in this case, the domain is going to be negative infinity to positive infinity, or sometimes spoken all real numbers. You can say either, and it's, it's correct. But if you're talking about for g of x equaling 1 over 2x minus 5, we can't have 2x minus 5 equaling 0, right? If 2x minus 5 equaled 0, we'd have 1 over 0, which is a big problem. That's dividing by 0, and that doesn't exist. So what we do is we look at that and we say, okay, we need 2x minus 5 to not equal 0. And we'll just solve that. So 2x equals 5, can't equal 5. x can't equal 5 halves. So the domain is going to be negative infinity to 5 halves with a parenthesis on the 5 halves because we can't include it. Union 5 halves to positive infinity. Now, how did I figure that out? The better, the more you do this, the better you get at, at not needing to do this. But if you need to, imagine a number line, and we're gonna plot. We're gonna plot right here five halves. Now that point needs to be plucked out, but everything else, everything else on the number line is fine. So that's negative infinity all the way up to five halves. That's the first piece, and then the second piece is five halves all the way to positive infinity. Both of those pieces work. So that's what we need to be looking out for. We just need to make sure we're not dividing by zero or taking square roots of negative numbers. Okay, and we'll do a couple examples and then we'll call it good, save for the extra practice problems at the end. So find the domains, find the domains. Part A will be g of x equals the square root of three x plus two. Part B will be f of x equals 1 over the square root of 3x plus 2. Part c will be h of x equals the cube root of x plus 2. Part d will be k of x equals 1 over x squared plus 9. And part e will be y equals the square root of x minus 3 over x minus 6. Quite a few. So let's go ahead and get started. Part A. So g of x is equal to the square root of 3x plus 2. So, in regards to this fu function, we need to make sure that whatever we plug in for x will make will give us a f an actual value. And what we do know is that as long as this is positive, it will um, it will uh, be defined. So what we really need is we need 3x plus 2 to be greater than or equal to zero because if the inside's equal to zero, the square root of zero is zero. If it's bigger than zero, then it's the square root of a number, which is fine. But if it's less than zero, then we have a problem. Then we're taking the square root of a negative number. So we solve this, we get x is greater than or equal to negative two thirds. So that means our domain should be bracket negative two thirds to positive infinity. And once again, I'm only I'm going to do this for this one and a couple other ones, but this one is the first one. So here's negative two thirds, and we want to include that 
but every and everything to the right of it, everything that's greater than it. So looking at a number line, that's from negative two thirds on to positive infinity. Now in stark contrast, I want these both here at the same time. Part B, f of x equals one over the square root of three x plus two. Now notice the difference. This is just the square root. This is one over that square root. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna say is we need three x plus two strictly greater than zero. Strictly greater than zero, not greater than or equal to. And the reason is we're not quote unquote greater than or equal to zero because we can't have the denominator equal to zero. Right? We can't have it greater than or equal to zero because if we if it was equal to zero, i.e. if we made x equal to negative two thirds here, then we'd have I'm gonna write it down but you don't need to. We'd have one over the square root of zero, which is one over zero, which does not exist. It's undefined. So that's why in this case I'm having to um, I'm having to solve three x plus two is strictly greater than zero which when you do that, we'll get x is strictly greater than negative two thirds, which by a similar situation as above would be that the domain is parenthesis this time, negative two thirds to positive infinity, and that would be our answer for part b. Part c was h of x equals the cubed root of x plus three. Now since it's an odd root, we can have negative numbers on the inside. So there's no issues. Let's kind of elaborate that on a little bit. So radical, like square roots and fourth roots and sixth roots, any even root, you can't take the even root of a negative number without it becoming a complex number. But with an odd root, like a third root or a fifth root or 17th root, those things you can plug in whatever you want and then the, the, uh, the radical will produce a real number. So there's no issues here. So our domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. Part D was k of x equals one over x squared plus nine. Now looking at this, what we know is we can't have we need x squared plus nine to not equal zero. However, x squared plus nine is always positive and never zero. So we're good. And what I mean by that is, if you remember, x squared plus nine, that's a sum of squares. And we learned that sums of squares are not factorable they're, they're prime polynomials. They are not factorable over the real numbers. No matter what you plug in for x here, you're always going to square it and then add 9 to it. So like, let's if you plug in 0, it'll be 0 plus 9, which is 9, which is greater than 0, strictly greater than 0. If you plug in negative 5, you'll get negative 5 quantity squared, which would be 25 plus 9, and that's going to be 34, which is once again positive. So no matter what you plug into the denominator, it will always be a positive number, and therefore this will never equal, the denominator will never equal zero, so there's no issues in this thing. So once again, the domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. Last is part E, which is y, which we can rewrite, so y, remember, it, it can be rewritten as a function, so let's just call it capital P of x. We could choose whatever letter we want, but this is going to be the square root of x minus 3 over x minus 6. Now notice, this has two conditions. First off, from the numerator, because it's a square root, we need x minus 3 to be greater than or equal to 0, meaning that we need x greater than or equal to 3. But we also have from the denominator that x can't equal 6, right? Because if x was equal to 6, then... We'd be dividing by zero, and that's a big problem. So we have two conditions that we need to satisfy. Now the answer, the domain, is going to be three to six union, uh, with a bracket on the three and a parenthesis on the six, and then union with a parenthesis on the six to positive infinity. Now why is that the case? 
Well, let's look at a number line and let's go ahead and plot three and six. So by the first one, we need, uh, by the, like the red, sorry, by the red, we need to make sure that all the numbers greater than or equal to three, the, like it, it can't be less than three. It has to be greater than or equal to three. But from the, uh, from the teal or whatever you want to call this color, we also know that it can't equal six. So we have to pluck this value out. That is to say, we're going to have to put barriers around it. So we have this first piece from bracket three to six parenthesis, and then we have the second piece from parenthesis six to positive infinity. So that, that's kind of a, like an, a, an interesting situation. So you need to take care of both of them. All right, and that'll do it for this video, except now we'll have the little extra practice problems. And so if you want to stop here, I'll see you in the next video. So here are the extra practice problems. Please feel free to pause if you want to write them all down first, or if you want to just do them one by one, feel free to continue onward. So question one, does the equation x equal, uh, x y cubed minus one equals zero define a y as a function of x? So what we want to know is, are we able to solve this in terms of y? Well, let's try. We should subtract, we should add one to both sides. xy cubed equals one, that gives us y cubed equals one over x. And then we don't want, like if it was a function, it would be able to be written as y equals, not y cubed equals. So let's try and take the third root of both sides. Now you might be tempted to think that you need to put a plus or minus, but that only happens with even roots. So if you take like the fourth root, you need a plus or minus. If you take the square root, you need the plus or minus. But with the cubed root, you don't need to. So the cubed root and the, the cube cancel, and we just have y equals the cubed root of one over x. And that is specifically one x value gives me one y value. There's no plus or minus here or anything like that. So yes, it is a function. And boom, pretty quick. The main thing I want to mention here is that, um, usually speaking, if you want a good intuition as to whether or not something's a function without even trying to solve it, if there's anything like a, a y raised to a fourth power or multiple y's in, in, in things, or an absolute value of a y, those are like kind of the main situations where you know it's not going to be a function. So, anyways, on to two. Find all these values of the function f of x equals the square root of x squared plus x. So, solution. This means we're just going to input all these values into the function. So part a, f of zero would be the square root of zero squared plus zero, which would be the square root of zero, which would be zero. If you want to just skip to the answer, you're more than welcome to on that one. Um, part b, f of negative one, that'll be the square root of negative one squared plus negative one. And for the same reason as, a, like, as we mentioned earlier, remember to keep your, your evaluations, if they're negative, make sure they're in parentheses. It doesn't hurt to put them in for the positives as well. I usually do, unless it's zero. Uh, that'll be the square root of one minus one, which will be the square root of zero, which will also be zero. It just so happened that, uh, that way. Part C, as confusing as it is, you're finding f of negative b. So that'll be the square root of negative b squared plus negative b which is just the square root of b squared minus b. And that's as simplified as we can get it. They usually want us to simplify our answer on these types of problems, so that's why I didn't leave it just as this. I needed to square this and then uh, make this a minus. Last but not least is they do want us to probably, uh, if, uh, they want us to, and by us, uh, like by they I mean me, um, for this one we're gonna need to simplify it but this is going to be the square root of, in parentheses, x plus h squared, plus, in parentheses, x plus h. Which will become, if we FOIL it out, we'll get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus x plus h. And if we look at this, there are no like terms, right? There's nothing that has just an x or just an h or just an x squared or just an xh or just an h squared. So that's as far as we need to go on this one. And that will complete part two. Part three. If f of x equals 2x squared minus x minus 6, find the values for which f of x is equal to 9. All right. So this statement means really what we're trying to do is set the function value 
this equal to 9 and find the x values. So this means that we're just going to set 9 equal to 2x squared minus x minus 6. Because f of x is equal to 2x squared minus x minus 6. So we're just trying to find when it's equal to 9. And that's a quadratic equation. So we can bring the 9 over. We get 2x squared minus x minus 15. And however you want to factor this, I'm going to just do it by trial and error. Hmm. Right, because then you get 5x minus 6x, which is the negative x, and then negative 15, boom. Okay, so that would give me that x is equal to negative 5 halves or 3. Those are two values for which f of x is equal to 9. And I, like, and I encourage you to verify this by plugging in this value for x into this and seeing that you get 9, similarly here. But I guarantee you, you will. And last but not least is this one, which is a very, very fun one. And this goes back to, I'm going to underline this, this part in, uh, in teal, or whatever the co this color is. So, we have that theorem from the previous page, uh, I don't remember what it was, but that if a comma b is on the graph of f, like th that it's on the graph of f, if and only if f of a is equal to b. So since negative 1 comma 12 is on the graph, that happens if and only if k of negative 1 is equal to 12. So what this means is that when we evaluate our function at negative 1, we should get 12. Therefore, 3 times negative 1 squared minus b times negative 1 plus 4 has to equal 12. Because this is, this is the function evaluated at negative 1, and we need it to be equal to 12. So that's going to be 3 plus b plus 4 equals 12. So remember, the negative 1 squared becomes positive 1, so that's why I get positive 3. Negative b times negative 1 gives me plus b. There we have it. So we have b plus 7 equals 12, which gives us that b should equal 5. Okay, that'll about do it for this one, and I'll see you in the next one.